Oh, kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to Cannons Creek. It's uh, absolutely lovely to be out here today um, for this afternoon's uh, stand-up. And thank you so much for making the effort to come out and join us. I just want to introduce, introduce who I've got with me here today. I've got Rachel Haggerty. Rachel's the Director of Strategy Planning and Performance at Capelin Coast and Hutt Valley District Health Boards. And I've got Dr Sean Hanna, who is the Clinical Director at Auditor PHO. And we're here at one of Auditor's clinics. And in fact, standing in their, uh, their CBAC or their, um, their swabbing centre here out in Cannons Creek. So um, I just want to acknowledge the staff who I've just been having a lovely time getting to know here, who have been working right through the pandemic, swabbing up to 40 people a day uh, in the centre here, uh, really contributing to the effort in this in, uh, community, very important part of our overall strategy. Now fortunately I have been well so far this year, so I have not been in a position where I have required a swab. But Dr. Hanna has kindly um, uh, recommended that I do have a swab today, and so I will be uh, making myself available for a swab after this, and if you're interested in um, uh, checking with me what that was like afterwards, I'm more than happy to provide some commentary. Um, just to demonstrate uh, what that actually involves, and it's what we've been talking about to all New Zealanders right through, but particularly at this time, uh, we've talked about not being complacent, and our uh, our swabbing and testing across our community is a really important part of our overall elimination strategy. We want to know if there is a case of COVID-19 that does sneak through the border, that we find it quickly and that we get onto it immediately. So for any of you out there who do have symptoms, seek advice from your GP or via Healthline about getting a swab. Uh, just in terms of the numbers today, there is one new case of COVID-19 in New Zealand. Uh, this is a case in managed isolation. And so it's now been 102 days since we last had a case of COVID-19 in the community uh, that we didn't know the source of. Today's case is a man in his 20s who arrived in New Zealand on the 30th of July from Melbourne. Uh, this person has been in managed isolation in the Grand Millennium Hotel and actually tested negative around day three of his stay, but has tested positive on the day 12 testing. And again, this emphasises the importance of testing twice uh, during that 14-day managed isolation period. There are some people who do not test positive in the first few days, uh, and so that's why we have that day 12 testing and the requirement to um, return a negative day 12 test before people leave managed isolation. So our total number of cases now of COVID-19, confirmed cases is 1,220, and we will update the WHO on that number. And we have 22 active cases in New Zealand at the moment. They are all in managed isolation or quarantine facilities. None are receiving hospital level care. And yesterday, our laboratories processed 1,874 tests, uh, and of those, 522 swabs were taken in managed isolation and quarantine. We often see a lower number on Mondays, um, and uh, we will be letting you know uh, in the next day or two where we're going to have pop-up clinics and a range of DHBs around the country. This week, you could see last week the value of those pop-up clinics uh, in terms of getting the community numbers of swabs uh, increased, but also in just raising the vi visibility and profile of the importance of swabbing. I wonder if I could hand over to Rachel and Sean just to make a few comments about the experience of the DHB and the, and the PHO um, over the last few months. Thank you, Ashley. Just really want to talk about what it is at a district health board with regards to coordinating our CBACs and our primary care testing centres. So in the Greater Wellington region across Hutt Valley and Cap Coast, we had 11 testing stations, CBAC testing stations, plus all of our primary care and four mobile teams during the height of the testing process. We still have all of that infrastructure available to us. There are currently a smaller number of CBACs, including this one here in Orotoa, and designated primary care practices available to test people. So we tested thousands, tens of thousands of people during that time, and we continue to have that availability to us. Really encourage people who are symptomatic to call their GP or to call Healthline. Many of our practices, even if you're not enrolled, will be able to provide you with that test, and that's a really important part of us protecting ourselves from our, um, the risk of COVID as we move forward. So essentially for us, the importance of primary care in places like Orotoa, not only for testing, but also for providing support to our families and to our whānau. So as um, Sean will talk about shortly, all of the social support, the ability to provide psychosocial backup, as well as general wellbeing and healthcare throughout 
all of the different levels, but remains important to people, particularly as we go through um, the aftermath of the lockdown and what we're dealing with now. So thank you. I'll hand over to Sean. Uh, kia ora no tato katoa. Um, Sean Hannah's my name. I'm a GP. I've been working in this community for nearly 20 years. Um, and I guess what really um, came to the forefront during lockdown and subsequently was uh, the cohesiveness of particularly this community, but also communities around New Zealand. Um, our uh, iwi uh, ngāti soa and, um, and uh, our health and social support staff were um, very proactive in um, reaching out, I guess, to our uh, older people, uh, to people with uh, health and disabilities, people who might not have the supports that they would have, particularly during lockdown, to make sure they had food, to make sure that they had firewood and that it was warm, and if they needed help, uh, that they were connected to their community and that health was forthcoming. So um, just a one, wonderful time to be delivering health services, I suppose, and made me really proud to be working here in Porirua. Uh, so this is a, a, a CBAC, it's um, uh, like a drive-through type uh, setup, and it was really uh, important for us to um, be able to look at everybody in the car when people were coming through. So we, um, lot, lots of CBACs had nursing staff and other, uh, other swabbers, uh, but we also had GPs, um, so we were able to deal with kids' skin infections, um, we were able to give flu vaccine uh, if it was um, indicated, uh, as well as COVID swabbing or treating um, whatever, whatever was needed really. Um, and in, in, in the process, I guess, we were keeping uh, people with respiratory symptoms and viruses away from our medical centre, where people without infectious diseases were able to access healthcare. So, yeah, kia ora. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Sean and Rachel. Uh, and you're most welcome to direct questions to the, uh, the pair of them as well um, once I uh, finish up. I'd just like to give you an update on our flu vaccination campaign. I know there's interest in that at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, during the 2020 campaign this year, we have distributed a record amount of flu vaccine. 1.77 million doses have been distributed to date. I think this is particularly pleasing given uh, the program did face challenges uh, through uh, both uh, disruption to international supply chains. Um, we had an increase in demand, of course, because of the interest in people avoiding uh, getting the flu and we were wanting people to get vaccinated. Uh, and also uh, there, was, there were impacts on our national distribution. So saying it's very satisfied that more people have been vaccinated than ever, despite those challenges. And I do want to thank uh, all the staff, um, Sean's mentioned some of them, but all the staff across our system including in general practice but also occupational health nurses and those in other settings, pharmacists and so on, who have uh, contributed to that uh, record high level of flu vaccine. Um, there were some temporary supply disruptions at the peak of the vaccination season and that certainly caused some challenges and some angst for some of our practices around the country. We worked very closely at the time with DHBs and others to redistribute vaccine where we could and it's pleased that in spite of those challenges we have been able to get this high level. Uh, and I should say we still do have vaccine available in the country and there is still great merit in people who haven't been vaccinated in getting vaccinated. Now sometimes we see a late peak in the um, flu season through into August and September, so there is still uh, benefit from being vaccinated and if people haven't had a flu vaccine, please do go ahead. And I guess just a final comment, we are already uh, planning the uh, possibility of a COVID uh, immunisation campaign of course and whilst there's still a lot of uncertainty about a vaccine, uh, whether and when a vaccine will be available and when New Zealand might get access to that we are not sitting idle, we have worked well underway to look at how we can could deliver that vaccine across the, uh, the population and of course that includes learning from our experience with our measles outbreak last year and also the, the issues that were identified this year in our influenza campaign and trying to uh, deliver vaccine and distribute it around the country when things were disrupted. So I'm happy to finish there and uh, welcome any questions. Why at the height of the supply shortage did you stand up and encourage New Zealanders then to go out and get vaccinated? Well, we didn't falter on our message about that. The, the, the important thing is for people to be vaccinated. It didn't require to be everybody to be vaccinated on the same day. I wanted to be consistent about the message. Yes, we knew there were some distribution issues, but we were also working carefully with our district health boards where possible to redistribute vaccine. And I think what we've seen is 
the consistency of that message about the value and importance of having a flu vaccine has led to a record high number of vaccines. But the consistency of that message was there was always flu vaccines available, which you're acknowledging that there was a shortage in supply. So was there a discrepancy between what was being said in those briefings? What was happening behind the I don't think there was a discrepancy. We were, and I've gone back and we've gone back and looked at what we were saying. We were, uh, we were clear about the challenge with distribution. We always had enough vaccine in the country, and there still is vaccine available, as I've said. So um, we had gone to uh, great efforts, and Pharmac, I think, had done a good job in ordering those extra 300,000 doses. We then got additional northern hemisphere doses just so we didn't run out um, and still have some of both of those still available. So we were consistent in acknowledging the distribution issues, we were consistent in our messaging about the value of getting a flu vaccine and we worked really hard with all the partners to make sure we could redistribute where possible. Do we have those emails showing that Pharmax warned there was very low stock, we've got people saying that we had to suspend all this or there'll be nothing to manage, how is that happening with the supply? So again, um, um, without uh, wanting to split hairs here, uh, we had a lot of vaccine. At all points in time, we had more vaccine distributed to the sector than we knew had been given. And so yes, we had at some points low stock centrally. So we um, uh, put in place measures to ensure that that was distributed fairly around the country. But we did know there was vaccine around the country in a range of places. And many DHBs were able to work to redistribute that within their rohi. That GPs and doctors feel like what was being said uh, was very different to what they were experiencing. Uh, I can recognise their frustration and I acknowledged that at the time and in fact spoke with a number of them to get to right to the bottom of what the issues were and do everything we could to address it. But again, I just want to come back. We have vaccinated more people than we ever have. We still have vaccine available and I think that goes to the heart of the effort that was put in by general practice and others to ensure people were vaccinated. But you acknowledged that it was your briefings that were the source of their frustration. Uh, that's not the message I've had from many GPs, but thank you for that question. Um, sorry, answer that. Okay, um, Dr. Blumper, why is that 4,000 test target remaining elusive? Well, the 4,000 is what we would get if we had good levels of community testing and if, we, had, if our, we were doing our day three and day 12 testing and managed isolation and quarantine, as well as our testing uh, of our managed isolation quarantine staff and our border staff. Uh, all, those, uh, uh, all that testing is happening, uh, and on some days it is lower. One of the things that's been really pleasing to see is people in the community have, um, I think, heard the message about the importance of testing, and we did see through the latter part of last week a number of days and into the weekend where we saw the testing volumes up around four and even 5,000. So it's really pleasing to see. It will go up and down each day, uh, but we're, our aim is to get around 4,000 uh, average per day. And what is the current symptom threshold for a GP to go, you need to go and get a COVID test? Well, do you want to comment on that, Sean? Uh, so pretty much any sort of flu-like illness. So if you've got a runny nose, if you've got a fever, if you've got shortness of breath, if you're coughing, um, uh, go contact your GP or ring Healthline and we can arrange as well. And has that threshold changed at all during the outbreak from when we first learned about COVID to now? Oh, it has from when we first learned about COVID. You'll re recall that right at the start, the um, case definition being used internationally was actually very um, narrow and it related to fever, cough and shortness of breath. And the fever had to be above 38 degrees, so it was quite significant. Uh, but as we've learned more, um, and of course one of the other really um, significant symptoms uh, that people have when they do have COVID-19 infection, we, we do know it's loss of smell and taste. Um, and so as more was known, we extended the range of symptoms. But as uh, Sean said, at the moment, it's a very low threshold. So a runny nose, sore throat, um, cough, cold, fever, of course, uh, we'd recommend anyone um, seek advice about getting this one. And you mentioned um, work was underway on a COVID immunisation um, programme. What is the current plan around distribution of a potential um, Vaccine. So I don't now. have the detail yet, what I just wanted to let people know was um, even though there's no vaccine uh, uh, yet being uh, tested and confirmed or in manufacture, we are starting already on our planning about how we might immunise immunize the population and about which groups we would do first to actually get the most benefit for New Zealand.
And just finally from me, you're getting a COVID swab today. Just to clarify, do you or do you not have any COVID symptoms as of right now? I've actually been asked. I don't have any COVID-like symptoms. Uh, I'm very well today, but uh, Dr. Hannah's uh, kindly recommended I have one. Uh, and it's partly just to uh, show people what's involved. Uh, because there are, you know, some people do find it a bit unpleasant. I'll be able to give a readout on that. Um, and also, you know, I'm not expecting anyone to do anything I wouldn't do myself. Dr. Bluesfield, are you confident that if there was another outbreak, that you'd have enough PPE for rest homes? Yes, and in fact, we're working really closely with our rest homes. We um, uh, did a review with them, and our response, uh, the action plan in response to that review was published just last week, and we're working very closely with them on um, not just PPE availability and use, but all their infection prevention control procedures. And um, you know, one of the reflections I would have as we look around the world is this is clearly a setting, as we found it, is very vulnerable. Um, and it was only by virtue of the fact that we worked incredibly closely with age residential care last time that we were able to limit the number of infections in, our, uh, in those settings and the number of associated um, deaths as well. And are you able to give us a general number of the amount of PPE that would be available for rest homes throughout the country? Oh, well, we would be supplying them with the PPE that they needed. We have very good stocks of PPE uh, and that is available um, as we did in the earlier part of the year to be distributed to all our healthcare workers, including those working in the community, so going out and visiting people in their homes to provide support for people with disabilities or with older people. Do you have any actual numbers for that amount of PPE? I don't have numbers for the PPE at the moment, but we have a large supply. We have um, more coming in all the time, and also our national distribution system, which um, towards the and I think the Office of the Auditor General acknowledged that, that once the Ministry had taken over that and worked closely with the DHPs, that that was getting PPE to all our healthcare workers. And lastly, the World Health Organisation is publicly praising New Zealand for its 100 days community transmission free. What do you make of that? Well, I think um, the, the message I get back from colleagues at WHO and around the world is um, because we're all interested in learning from each other, uh, and also it's very important in a pandemic like this, uh, that people have hope that actually if you do do the right things, you can get on top of this virus. So I think countries look to New Zealand um, with hope, but I also have seen those reports uh, reminding us, as we are reminding ourselves every day, that we cannot afford to give an inch, um, we cannot afford to be complacent. So um, it's nice to have hit the milestone, but uh, we want it to uh, continue and, uh, and hence you know, we need to be constantly vigilant. In that case confirmed today, what facility were they in? That was, uh, let me just check here, that was in the uh, Grand Millennium facility. Now the person, of course, as we always do, is now transferred to the um, quarantine facility. Are there any questions for my colleagues here? Uh, are GPs still experiencing people turning down um, doing a COVID test? Um, yes, unfortunately. So I think it, it goes back to what Dr Bloomfield was saying about this sense of complacency. We don't have to look very far past our borders to realise that COVID-19 is still here. And it's, I think, part of our responsibility as New Zealanders that if we're asked to go and get a swab, then we, you know, put our nostrils on the line as the Director General's <laughs> about to do in, in a moment. And what are the main reasons that people give GPs in terms of not wanting to do a test? I guess it's um, maybe that they've had one before, um, maybe their friends have and they haven't liked that experience. There's lots of rumours around the place about it being an unpleasant experience. I mean, I've had a number of swabs and a number of my colleagues have got smaller kids than I have have had a lot of swabs as well, and I think it's uh, our, our responsibility, I think, as New Zealanders to step up and, and do what's advised for the benefit of all of us. What's the demand like for testing from the public? Like, are you getting significant numbers of people coming in asking for a test? No, people are coming in with respiratory symptoms and coughs and colds, and then we're suggesting, or we're saying, hey, we'd better do a COVID test. So it's not being publicly driven? Uh, no, I think like a lot of people, uh, we're, we're back, back to normal, aren't we? And we're doing normal things and we're catching normal colds. But it's really, really important that we're swabbing lots of people to make sure that those normal colds aren't um, chains of transmission of COVID-19 in the community. I think one of the things I would add is that the test is free to people. So people are often used to having to pay a part charge when they go to general practice. So all COVID tests are free to everybody in New Zealand and that's important too because we understand that that might be a barrier in people's perception as to whether they should seek out a test. So if you go to a doctor and you've got COVID symptoms and you want a test, will you have to pay for the consult or can you just go and just No, you won't. What about if you don't have symptoms and you want a COVID test, do you have to pay? Do 
we have to have symptoms to qualify for a test because that's what we're seeking out. So that's an important part. I'm sure it's already explained those symptoms. I'll just um, add to that. Um, what we have seen uh, where we've done some specific community surveillance, like in Queenstown last week, we had a pop up and over a thousand people were tested. Not all of those people um, were symptomatic. The test was free, but what we were trying to do there was just check and see that there was no um, uh, infection in that community, which, which was the case, which is good. So there will be occasions when we're doing that surveillance testing where asymptomatic people can be tested, and in that case, it will be free. Uh, thanks very much, I appreciate the questions, and uh, we'll just move on to the next feature in today's show. I didn't recognise you as well. It has been a long time. Um, yes. So we'll teach you the results, which I'm sure are going to be negative. Um, one of our details is probably not really good. Thank you. So 48 hours I'll be there. I noticed I was having a swab. Uh, and as you can see, it sort of made my eyes water. That was a bit involuntary, uh, but not painful. Um, and way uh, less uncomfortable than when fizzy drink goes up the back of your nose, uh, which you might remember from when you were a child. I certainly do. So yeah, a little bit uncomfortable, but not unpleasant at all. What were you expecting? Any different from that? Oh, well, um, it's been talked up quite a bit. So actually, it's good to sort of um, uh, you know, for it to be less than perhaps what you might be expecting, so yeah, that's fine. Do you have words of reassurance then to people out there? Yeah, look, um, uh, it was much less painful than uh, tackling Billy Wepu uh, on the rugby field a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, I've still got the bruise to show for that. Uh, and yeah, just, uh, you know, probably less than having an influenza vaccination or, um, or anything like that. So I'd recommend to people, um, if you are offered a swab, go ahead and do it. Did it tickle? Uh, yeah, I guess it tickled a little bit, yeah, yeah, um, so yeah, if I can just say say yes to the test. Some people describe it as, uh, feels a bit like you've had your brain scrambled, <laughs> would you agree with that? Or? No, not really, not really, no, uh, may, uh, hopefully that means my brain's still functioning, but um, uh, no, it's really just a little, uh, it's just a little unpleasant feeling at the back of the nose and, and it passes straight away. Yeah, thanks very much everyone, appreciate it. Good job.